Welcome to BizTech's Ambassador Conversation Show. Today, our conversation is with His Excellency Charles He, High Commissioner of the United Kingdom to Malaysia. Now, Your Excellency, welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Now, Your Excellency, could you start by sharing us an overview of the UK economy today and some of the key sectors of growth? Yeah, so the UK economy, of course, has been hit by COVID like, uh, like every other has, but we have been fortunate in that we launched our vaccine program quite early and we got through it quite quickly. So we've been able essentially to open up completely as of around July. Uh, and we're seeing now uh, potential growth rates this year, some 7% and next year, maybe 5 to 6%. And of course, like many other countries, we're seeing some supply chain issues, some shortages, which have been widely reported, like, for example, uh, truck drivers in our labor market. Um, but broadly speaking, the UK is now back open for business and on track. And, you know, with the truck driver issue, I realized that uh, when I did the research on that was the fact that a lot of the truck drivers in the UK were from Europe. And so they've all gone back. And as a result, they can't come back in. Uh, is that the issue? And it's 100,000. It's a lot of people. Yeah, but if you look across Europe, what you'll see is that, in fact, every country is short of truck drivers. I think we're a bit uh, we're a bit shorter than others because, as you say, quite a number of us were from European Union countries. Now, many of them can come back, but because there's shortages in their own countries, they're finding it easier to stay at home, as it were, and then uh, bargain for higher wages. Uh, and we've seen a number of um, efforts to draw people into the market, but it takes uh, it takes time to, to train new truckers. So we're going to have problems with supply chains for a little while. Now, you actually see one of the things that, and you mentioned the, the expected growth rates uh, this year, and next year, which are commendable. Uh, part of the reason for that was probably the early intervention also of the UK government in terms of stimulus. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about that? Because that, that has now with hindsight turned out to be absolutely the right decision. Yes, so, the, so my government had a very bold stimulus package uh, called the furlough program. And essentially they, paid the wages of um, many people who were unable to work because of COVID. And that includes, for example, self-employed people and a lot of people who've up to now probably never been beneficiaries of kind of state intervention. And it's been the largest state intervention, certainly in, in living memory. And it, it can only be compared to sort of wartime expenditure. Now, some people were concerned at the beginning of all of this that it would be uh, too expensive. But I think experience has shown that that has shielded us from uh, severe economic damage. Now, of course, you can make the argument that a number of people who've been supported uh, probably, you know, would have lost their jobs anyway, and that may be true. But I think, on balance, as a program, it's been judged a success. Now, let's zoom in on Malaysia and, and the UK. How has that impacted the, the whole trade balance? Could you give us some insights into UK's exports and investments to Malaysia? Uh, and since you've been here, coming up to three years. Yeah, so Malaysia is a major trade partner for the UK. It's our second largest business partner in ASEAN with uh, annual trade in both directions of around five billion pounds. And trade has, has kept up pretty well, really, all things considered. Uh, if you take out travel industry, for example, of course, which has uh, fallen sharply with the COVID crisis, uh, trade is not down by as much as you might have expected. Uh, and we see, for example, exports of UK cars, which is one of our largest export segments to Malaysia, holding up well. And equally, Malaysian exports to the UK have held up pretty well as well, with major export sectors being electronic goods, uh, rubber products, and particularly, of course, PPE has been an important sector uh, during the COVID crisis. So I think our bilateral trading relationship is in pretty good shape. And, and where do you see, uh, prior to your arrival in Malaysia, there was a lot of Malaysian investment in the UK on the property sector. So if you look at the uh, uh, Canary Wharf sector and uh, a couple of key projects, I think by Sang Darby and SP Satya, um, those were big ticket items, but where does Malaysia invest in the UK in general? So yes, there've been some very big ticket Malaysian investments. And before I came here, I visited the Battersea Power Station project, which is probably the biggest and best known of all. I think it's one of the ones you were referring to there. Uh, that has been a tremendous success. Uh, Battersea Power Station, uh, we have a house near there, and it's been an eyesore for, literally for generations. Uh, but the Malaysians have come in and they've done what other developers failed to do. They've actually turned it into a viable project. When the UK decided to leave the European Union, 
uh, and in the negotiations that followed. Uh, my predecessor and I have kept in very close touch with the Malaysian investors in the UK to talk to them about what they thought about Brexit and whether they were still committed to the UK. And the answer has consistently been that they are still committed to the UK and that Brexit has, in effect, made no difference. And the reasons they give for the UK being a good uh, investment target destination uh, for Malaysians is uh, stability, economic and political stability, uh, its rule of law, predictability, uh, its language issues, its a familiarity with the legal system, uh, and a, a, a strong affinities with the UK as well. So many Malaysians have been educated in the UK. It's a very comfortable place for them to be and a very comfortable place for them to do business. What we've seen during the COVID pandemic is probably a slowing down of investment. But when I talk to investors, they tell me that they're ready to come in when the conditions are right and they have confidence in the long term future in the UK. We are seeing a slight change in the pattern of investment. In the past, it was very much London focused, but now we're seeing more interested in, uh, in, in investing outside of London. I mean, particularly, for example, in student accommodation uh, and other uh, property uh, areas like that, but outside London, which is, which is interesting and important. Now, Ambassador He, how about UK companies investing in Malaysia? Which are the big ticket investments that have come in in the last couple of years? And do you see uh, more coming in in the horizon? Yes, it's again a similar picture. There's, a, there's been a pause, if you like, rather than a cancellation of investments. Uh, but we've seen some really interesting, uh, interesting ones. For example, Smith & Nephew, who are a manufacturer of advanced medical devices. In fact, they, they make um, hip and knee joints. Uh, they are they've broken ground on a new factory in the Penang area uh, because they see expanding markets across Asia, particularly in China. For their as we all age, the populations are all aging, so we need more artificial hips and knees. Absolutely, uh, and that's a great example of an advanced manufacturing company that sees real potential in Malaysia. We've also seen huge amounts of interest in the tech sector. And we've now got 100 companies that are uh, MSC uh, certified in the tech field. And again, they see great potential here. There's, um, uh, there are no language issues, familiarity with the legal system, and a great pool of graduates of human resource here in Malaysia for them to employ. So I foresee lots more investment into Malaysia from UK companies, also using Malaysia as a stepping stone to uh, ASEAN and wider Asia. And Ambassador, hey, what can we do better? Because like you said, there's a good pool of people here, many of whom are trained in Australia and the UK. How can we, what can we do better to attract more investments? Because the competition for investments in ASEAN is very, very stiff. Also, there's a realignment of global supply chains where perhaps Malaysia could take advantage of what what can we do better to attract British businesses? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Yeah, so I think you have great teams attracting investment in the, into Malaysia. You've got MIDA, you've got InvestKL. But I think there are a few things that, uh, that could perhaps be, be looked at again. One that I would mention is if there's a desire to make Malaysia a hub for entry into ASEAN and into wiser Asia, uh, you need to make sure that it's possible for regional staff to be able to travel around uh, and not just British nationals or Malaysians, but people from all over the world who need to circulate through. And there are some great examples, incidentally, of companies that are using Malaysia as their regional hub, like BAE Systems, who have a big cyber centre uh, here in, in Malaysia. Another thing I would suggest is an opening up of some of the service sector, because I think that would really help support businesses from outside coming into Malaysia. So one example that I often quote is the legal services sector. At the moment, it's very hard for foreign legal firms to operate in Malaysia. There are only two, they're both British, uh, and they are quite constrained in what they can and can't do. And I know there's concerns about opening up the services markets. You know, you have local players who perhaps don't want others coming in, but I strongly believe that opening up service markets is actually good for local service providers because they get a chance to compete with global players and then themselves to have the opportunity to compete on a global stage. So they're just a few things that I think could be done better. But I, I do have to commend the Malaysian government. Throughout this pandemic, they have ensured that production flowed. Uh, and while, of course, 
you know, it would be nice for companies to be able to produce at 100% rather than say 60% or 80% or whatever. They have made it possible for companies to continue to produce during the COVID pandemic. Ambassador Head, that's an interesting point about the services sector, because legal industry uh, specifically, because one of the things, one of the, uh, the positives I can see out of that is if the legal market is opened up, more companies will then uh, house their legal, uh, regional legal teams in Malaysia, and therefore we steal some business away from Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Because all <laughs> regionally, everything is in Singapore. Singapore foreign lawyers are allowed to operate. And it, it, it's an easy market, as you said, for people to go in and out, for them to practice, for them to look after their regional uh, markets. Yes. So what happens in practice when Malaysian companies need lawyers to do big cross-border transactions is they, they bring in lawyers from elsewhere because... Malaysian lawyers have not had the experience in that kind of transaction because they're not exposed to that kind of uh, to that kind of competition. Uh, and uh, you know, in the UK, for example, um, we have a very important finance industry, as you know, the second biggest finance centre in the world, probably. Yes. But it's not just about finance institutions. It's not just about banks. It's also about um, it's about investment services. It's about lawyers. It's about accountants. It's about consultants. Um, it's about invest, investment analysts and all these people come together to form a rich ecosystem. But you won't get that ecosystem unless you allow more competition to come in from outside uh, to build the ecosystem. So, for example, in the UK, of course, there are some limitations on what foreign lawyers can do, but there are very few. And there are over 200 foreign legal firms operating in the UK. And the whole legal services market has expanded enormously over the last 20 years. So there's plenty more pie to go around. Now, one of the things that's uh, been a byproduct of Brexit is Britain has changed its outlook. There have been uh, significant changes in uh, uh, UK defense and foreign policy, because in March, I think you had, there was an announcement after a year long review that the UK is pledging to shift its focus towards the Indo-Pacific region, um, which your foreign secretary, Dom Dominic Rabb, Decide, uh, it describes as increasingly the geopolitical center of the world, and I quote unquote. Can you share with us the thoughts of how this thinking has changed and how it's going to impact countries like Malaysia? Yeah, so it was all part of uh, a major piece of work that was done really to, to refashion the UK's uh, role outside with us having left the European Union. So we took a, a long look at all of our external engagements. So foreign policy, defense, security, development, all in one integrated way. So that's why it's called the integrated review. And we also looked, of course, at the way the world was changing and the drivers for change. And it's blindingly obvious that this part of the world is growing uh, extremely fast economically. The middle class here is expanding enormously. There are huge opportunities in this part of the world. Of course, there are also some risks of, of conflict. There are flashpoints around this region in Korea, for example. Uh, but as a region as a whole, it was clear through that review process how important and increasingly important it was going to become for the UK. So as a result of that, uh, we are um, very much focusing more on this part of the world. And you can see that in a number of ways. So firstly, the UK applied for and we've now secured dialogue partner status with ASEAN. Now, we used to have this status through the European Union, but of course we lost it when we left the European Union, but now we have it uh, as a bilateral um, sovereign state. Uh, and that was important. It's the first time in 25 years that ASEAN has admitted a new dialogue partner, and they had to lift a moratorium uh, on that to do it. That was one thing. Secondly, the UK has applied to become a member of the CPTPP. Uh, and again, that's an important point because we now are developing our own independent trade capacity and trade policy on departure from the European Union. And that's going to be an important part of it. And then we've seen uh, the, uh, the UK carrier strike group, the Queen Elizabeth, which sailed through the Malacca Straits a few weeks ago, is now in Japan, uh, in the Sea of Japan. Uh, and um, that is a very physical, if you like, manifestation of our commitment to this part of the world and our ability to project ourselves it's the first time in about 20 years that we've had a UK carrier strike group uh, come as far east as this. On, on the, on a, from a perception basis, uh, Your Excellency, 
that has a negative and a positive perception. In some circles, that's seen as a positive that the UK is engaged in this part of the world. On, in some circles, it's seen as a negative because it brings back the, the, the images of gunboat diplomacy. What are your thoughts on that? There are always people who can interpret things negatively. But I mean, we've been very careful. If you look at the way that the carrier strike group is deployed uh, through the waters in this region, it's been a, a confident but not confrontational uh, approach. You know, our aim is not to provoke anybody, uh, not to threaten. It's simply to exercise freedom of navigation uh, and to um, engage with our allies. So as this carrier strike group has been sailing around with its accompanying ships, it's been engaging in exercises and visits uh, with a number of allies in the region, including a very successful naval exercise with Malaysia uh, on its way around. So I, I reject any idea that it's that it's somehow you know threatening or dangerous. Now, you just brought up the uh, joint exercise with uh, the Malaysian uh, armed forces. Could you kind of shed light in terms of the defense cooperation which has been a traditional, traditionally a very strong link, but has weakened over the last few years. What's the state of that right now? Well, I would put it the other way around. I would say that it's actually strengthening now after a period where arguably you could say it was, it was rather weaker. So the UK, of course, as you know, is a member of the Five Powers Defence Arrangement, along with uh, Singapore, New Zealand and Australia and Malaysia, of course. Uh, and that has been a, an enduring defense arrangement. It's, it's unique in this part of the world. It's celebrating this year its 50th year. Uh, and every year we hold exercises together, we work together as allies, uh, and on the way back, the Carrier Strike Group will be carrying out an exercise linked to the FBDA 50th anniversary, which is a major, uh, a major event for this year. So I think our defense and security relationship is as strong now as, as it ever has been. And what is the state of Malaysia's and UK's diplomatic relations? Um, has it been impacted by the fluidity in political relations of uh, political landscape in Malaysia because of all the changes in government? No, that, that sort of political change doesn't really influence basic diplomatic relationships because our interests will continue to be as they are. Our interests endure. Uh, and our relationships endure and the relationship between Britain and Malaysia is so deep and strong uh, that it can withstand any kind of momentary political uncertainties. I mean, I, I go back a bit to the point I was making earlier about education. So some half a million Malaysians have been educated in the UK. That creates an enormous reservoir or pool of people here who understand the UK, who hopefully like and appreciate the UK. Uh, and the UK and Malaysia are united in so many ways, um, education being the most important, but also all the other things that I've talked about. And with the UK's uh, tilt towards the Indo-Pacific, again, I can only see the relationship becoming stronger. Now, the UK, as you pointed out, we've traditionally had very strong ties because of this education base as a framework for understanding. What are the other cultural and social understanding, uh, from a cultural and social understanding standpoint, as well as uh, I think some cooperation in climate change that we've started to get even closer together? Can, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, I mean, perhaps just a word more about that sort of shared cultural understanding. I mean, it is interesting how, how familiar so many things in Malaysia feel to somebody from the UK as you come here. So obviously the language point, um, obviously the, uh, the, the legal system is basically almost the same. There's the Westminster parliamentary yeah. system. But also if you go further, we're, we're doing some very interesting work with the Malaysian prison service to help reform um, and improve conditions in Malaysian prisons. And the Malaysian prison service is basically mod was modeled on the UK prison service. So they understand each other and they recognize each other's ways of working and so on. The same is true of the police, the same is true of the armed forces. So there's a huge amount of kind of shared cultural understanding, but we, we can't be complacent, you know, we can't take that for granted. We have to continue to work on our, on our, on our relationship. And again, to come back to that education point, one of the things that I would love to change and I'm trying to change is the fact that many thousands of Malaysians study in the UK, very, very few Brits study in Malaysia. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. 
but the UK has just launched a new overseas student mobility scheme called Turing, the Turing scheme, which replaces the Erasmus scheme, which we had when we were in the EU. And that now allows for possibilities of British students to, to travel and study for, for periods of time of you know, one term or even a few weeks all over the world. And we're seeing a great deal of interest from Malaysian institutions who want to attract touring students from the UK. So I'm very hopeful about that. And on your point about climate change, Malaysia, of course, is a key partner as uh, we work towards COP26, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties, which is happening in, in uh, Glasgow at the beginning of November, um, only two and a bit months away. Uh, and Malaysia is very important because of the forest cover here. Malaysia is a mega diverse country and therefore biodiversity here is critically important. Uh, and we've been working very closely with the Malaysian government as they prepared their, their plan, the so-called NDC, national, Nationally Determined Contribution. Uh, and we're confident we'll see a strong Malaysian presence uh, at, the, uh, at the COP itself in Glasgow. Now, Your, Your Excellency, we're, we're in very uncertain times. Uh, the UK is opening up in terms of, uh, from the summer, basically, travel has opened up, the economy has opened up. ASEAN is still uh, uh, in, in a difficult spot. Malaysia is still in a difficult spot. Where do you see the opportunities for us to collaborate and develop trade relationships and enhance them over the next 24 months? Well, we've been thinking very hard about how we can boost our trade relationship here. And I've said it's a good trade relationship, but it is. But I do think it could be better. I think we can do better across the board. So we agreed with MITI that we would set up uh, a joint committee to look at ways we can reduce the barriers to trade between our two countries. And we're looking at a number of different areas. One of them is legal services. We're also looking at education. We're looking at how we do small businesses. We're looking at obstacles uh, in the wines and spirits trade and so on and so forth. And I'm confident that through that process, we will identify and break down further barriers to business. We've also been uh, working around the fact that uh, British businessmen, British ministers have not been able to travel to Malaysia and indeed nor have Malaysians been able to travel east into the UK. And personal relationships, as you know, in this part of the world are immensely important. But we have been able to run some virtual uh, trade missions here. In fact, we're running one at the moment uh, on tech, we've run them on health. So what we've tried to do is, if you like, sow the seed so that when things open up, those relationships that we started to uh, started to establish will burgeon and grow into new business in both directions. Your Excellency, it's been a fascinating conversation. Leave us with some final thoughts before we end this conversation. So um, I'm an optimist. Uh, I, it's been a very difficult uh, 18 months with the COVID pandemic. It's affected us all in so many ways. Uh, it has put a dampener uh, on business and trade. Um, but I think the will and the desire on both sides, and you know, we've referred to the political uncertainties that have been here over the last couple of years, but all of the ministers in every government that I've talked to all share the same desire to do more with the UK and to work harder to make our bilateral relationship, including our trade and business relationship, uh, even more productive than ever in the future. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for taking your time to be on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to His Excellency Charles Hay, High Commissioner of the United Kingdom to Malaysia, on Vistax Ambassador Conversation Show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.vistax.asia. Please subscribe or like to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.